Let's get right into this video and see what kind of mark we can make. You guessed it, today is all about skid mark. Cyril Columbani was born in Los Angeles, California. From a young age, Cyril, per his file card, was annoyingly polite, maddeningly well-groomed, and excruciatingly successful with his studies. This is the kid where moms would say, why can't you be more like your friend Cyril? Type of kid who'd get some wedgies at school, maybe leaving some skid marks behind. But that all changed when he got his driver's license. He let it all out, shattering speed records and amassing a large collection of moving violations, leaving even more skid marks behind, this time on the pavement. Too many for something like, say, a CDL, so he went another route. Cyril enlisted in the United States Army. After basic, he specialized as 88 Mike, an Army motor transport operator, warfighters that operate all tactical wheeled vehicles across all types of terrain, something he learned in AIT at Fort Leonard Wood. His secondary MOS is 11 Bravo infantry, allowing for both mounted and dismounted operations. He took those same qualities he had as a kid and brought them to the barracks. His other battle buddies might have resented him for this if he wasn't the fastest, most reliable recon driver around. I'm going to score his orange colors as a byproduct of his Transportation Corps connection before his PCS to G.I. Joe's pit. Orange, specifically International Orange, is a safety color and is also used for operations like experimentation, testing, and even scientific expeditions. The orange signals to an enemy that these are non-combatants. The high-vis orange will help Columbani in the motor pool to, well, not get run over, just like the bright orange that the Coast Guard uses. He wasn't always orange, though. Check out this presentation concept artwork by George Woodbridge, a freelance artist who did a lot of internal work for Hasbro. Here he's brown and green, loading a magazine into his 45 while carrying a drop-holstered boomstick on his thigh. The colors were ostensibly changed later to match his vehicle, a concept of which you can see in the background in black and white, along with the beginnings of what the line would bring for the colorways in the next couple of years. Designed by Guy Cassidy in 1987, G.I. Joe's Desert Fox vehicle boasts a 327 CID 350 BHP supercharged engine and rides on three-layer wheels and scout all-terrain tested bulletproof tires that are resistant to heat and punctures. It's armed with two Scorpion SS-12 anti-tank missiles and a rear-mounted 20 Mike Mike auto-loading anti-aircraft cannon that links to the close-range surveillance radar and tubular whip antenna. Interestingly, the front grille of the Desert Fox has five vertical slots. This is different than both Jeep and Hummer that have seven slots. And the reason for this is licensing. Seven slot grills are already owned by their companies, so royalties would have had to be paid out if Cassidy and the team opted for a seven slot front grill. The stickers on the side include the numbers 8 and 7 to reflect the year it was designed, 1987. You'll also see the letters G and C, which are Guy Cassidy's initials. He tended to sneak in things like that to his designs. Cassidy's edict was to balance cost with the cool factor, along with playability. So it got the side rockets that would burn off the face of its occupants if they were fired from that position, but hey, ignore that. An earlier version also had working spotlights, but those were cost reduced out. There was going to be a windscreen too, but that was also cost reduced out. Cassidy used his Coastal Defender as a guide when designing the trailer hitch in the aft portion of the vehicle. Of note, SS-12 is the designation for a French surface-to-surface -surface wire guided missile, done so by manual command to line of sight. It's slightly larger than its SS-11 anti-tank missile predecessor, such as the one here mounted on a VLRA 4x4. The Desert Fox came in tan and black with orange accessories, a perfect bridge between years prior and to what was to come. The box for the Desert Fox says that this is the military's number one fast attack frontline assault unit and it can barrel through 30 foot high sand dunes while patrolling for Cobra infiltrators. So Skidmark's name is an obvious double meaning like many G.I. Joe codenames. Driving the Desert Fox, he left rubber on the road and maybe left his passengers with soiled pants after whipping around in his truck. But what about the name Desert Fox? For that answer, we head to North Africa during World War II. The deepwater port city of Tobruk on the Mediterranean coast of Libya was, for a while, controlled by Graziani's Italian forces. It needed to be captured as that was a critical port that would serve as a staging point for defensive operations in Egypt to control the critical Suez Canal. In 1941, British forces working with Australia's 6th Division pushed the Italians out and the city fell. The 6th Australian Division was soon relieved by Major General L.J. Morshead's new 9th Australian Division and served as garrison in Tobruk and the western desert of North Africa. They were the last line of defense holding back Axis forces from taking Cairo and the canal. Field Marshal of the AfriCorps, Rommel, aka the Desert Fox, was sent in to retake the city from the Allies. A predator sent to wipe out the desert rats. As we all know, rats are prey to predators like fox, hence the connection. 
The garrison that remained in Tobruk included 14,000 Australian soldiers from Australia's 9th and 7th Divisions, and they'd later be evacuated into the sea and relieved by the Polish Independent Carpathian Rifle Brigade. Just the 213th remained with them until they pushed forward and linked up with the British 8th Army. It was an Axis propagandist who coined the Desert Rat nickname, something that the Australian forces defiantly embraced as a compliment. Through the course of this time, special operators played a key role in the Allies' success. The long-range desert group sent patrols to penetrate deep behind enemy lines for covert ISR and raiding operations. They operated on their own and used their own heavily armed customized jeeps to transport SAS commandos deep into the desert, earning them the nickname the Libyan Desert Taxi Service. This was a volunteer-only unit made up of operators from England, New Zealand, Australia, and even Zimbabwe. While they were transporting SAS, they conducted their own combat operations as well. In 1957, the Australian Army stood up their own Special Forces Regiment, modeled on Tier 1 and Tier 2 Special Forces units, like Britain's SAS and the Z Special Unit that operated in the Pacific Theater during World War II. Some of the Rats of Tobruk trained Z Special Unit operators once their unit was stood down after the decision came to not transfer them to the Pacific Theater. They're called SASR, or Special Air Service Regiment, SAS for short. SAS Regiment uses this long-range patrol vehicle here, a modified Land Rover in 6x6 configuration. You can definitely see some Desert Fox in the LRPV. But now, they're rocking the Mercedes G-Wagon 6x6 in a variety of configurations like SRV or Surveillance Recon Vehicle. There's also the Cargo, Command, and Ambulance variants, among others. And there's that Supercat Special Operations Vehicle Commando, which is built upon the Mark II HMT Extenda. Now, before we move on, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Tony at Analog Toys for his service with Australia's armed forces. So the Joe's Desert Fox is classified as a fast attack vehicle, FAV. These were later called DPVs or Desert Patrol Vehicles, same thing as the G.I. Joe Ostriker. The Marines later also moved to the M1161 Growler as it was easy to transport internally with an MV-22 Osprey. They've since moved on to a military Razor, the MRZR. SOCOM is using a newer DPV called the Light Strike Vehicle, now the Advanced LSV. Others of note would be the Flyer 60 and the Flyer 72, officially designated M1288 GMV, which supplanted the role that the modified Humvee GMV 1.1 did for a while. So now let's move back to Skidmark. Skidmark first appeared in comic book form in Marvel Comics and Larry Hama's G.I. Joe A Real American Hero comic book series with issue 72. This was at a time when Serpentor was working with Dr. Mindbender on his latest creation, which was converting a Strato Viper into a Star Viper. He had an electromagnetic shunt in his brain to increase his reflexes and lethality and increase strength, which would allow him to absorb inhuman heavy G-loads from the new Stiletto rocket plane. His first test, after punching flies out of the air like an evil Mr. Miyagi, was a G.I. Joe shuttle launch facility, which would give Serpy an upper hand against the Fred version of Cobra Commander and the Baroness. In Utah, we see Wildcard driving a mean dog with Skidmark operating the Desert Fox right behind him, both heading back toward base. On the way back on the highway, they saw Star Viper in his ACDC shirt trying to hitchhike on this highway, perhaps a highway to hell. As a Star Viper, it's a long way to the top, but before he flew, he was tasked with dirty deeds done dirt cheap. It was Skidmark who said to Windmill, My mommy always said don't pick up hitchhikers. I guess that was his PSA moment. Anyway, the Viper disappeared and made it into the pit, and he did so by hiding on the Desert Fox's undercarriage, unbeknownst to driver Skidmark, with sniffers, detectors, inspection mirrors, and cameras that really wouldn't work these days, but we'll roll with it. Skidmark was berating Windmill about safety regulations, and Windmill had to tell him to just can it. He did the same thing to Gung Ho and Dusty, who met them at the front gate to inspect their papers. Notable here, too, is the color of Skidmark's uniform, which is all green. Spirit brought them below decks to get their tour with Iceberg, as they were still being processed in. Star Viper ended up stealing the black box from the Joe's shuttle and stealing an Ost record to escape out into the desert to link up with a bat for extraction. On egress, Star Viper sabotaged the blast door so the only way G.I. Joe could pursue him were with the Mean Dog and Desert Fox that were still parked topside. They brought their onboard weapons to bear on the Ost striker, but his advanced reflexes allowed him to avoid the shots and escape with a battle android trooper's big rig that had a stiletto hiding in the trailer, which led to General Hollingsworth on his personal C-5A Galaxy to recommend a human gathering up on Cobra Island ahead of a full landing force. This critical lead-up, which included Skidmark, led right into Cobra Civil War. Later, Skidmark and his Desert Fox were with General Liederkranz testing G.I. Joe equipment on the border of Darklonia at the same time that Darklon wanted to test his new Pythonization technology. They were pursued by Python Patrol stuns while Cobra Commander and the Baroness were briefly surrounded by MBT Maulers and Slams, that is before Destro bombed them from a Python conquest. In issue 100, Skidmark was with Dusty patrolling the desert outside the pit when they found a Cobra agent as Arana looked on.
on maniacally from a distant hill. The team got another top secret mission from General Hollingsworth, so under the cover of night, they loaded a mobile command center and a desert fox onto a Russian transport plane, an AN-24 Condor. They were tasked with linking up with the October Guard to take Sierra Gordo back from Destro, the same place many of the older October Guard were KIA. Their plane was hit by Darklon's forces, but they touched down and made it into the surrounding jungle. The desert fox was taken into the jungle with Flint, Lady J, Muskrat, and Roadblock on board. No skid mark though. This was while the October Guard rode in and on their new BMP, but the BMP was immobilized by direct fire, so the Desert Fox crew went back and severely overloaded the vehicle with the October Guard. Muskrat traversed the main cannon to 6 o'clock and pumped a few heat rounds right through the canopy of the pursuing Razorback. Flint then floored it and launched the Desert Fox right over a canyon and landed successfully on the other side, a moment that I know I reenacted many times, not in real life with my toys. Darkline's Razorback column was stuck now, unable to follow. Later though, the trail was blocked and they had to abandon the path and utilize some indigenous peoples to keep pushing on. While Cobra pounded the jungle with napalm dropped from Condor bombers, the Joes and the Desert Fox slowly crawled along the jungle floor as those Tukaros cut a new path with machetes. Muskrat, Lieutenant Gorky, and some Tukaros were hit when the bombs landed, so they used the Desert Fox as a medical transport. They managed to make it to another sector just as Darklon's tanks pounded the jungle with explosive ordnance. They were surrounded and quickly running out of options when Wild Bill showed up in a locust while Stretcher and Hot Seat and a Raider jumped off a train to extract their team. It was a very hot LZ, so instead of close air support or medevac, Wild Bill was hit and crashed, so, well, he needed help too. If you notice, Wild Bill seems to crash a lot. They made it to a ravine to continue escaping while Darklon's forces followed from a parallel ravine. And then, during the Civil War on Cobra Island, in G.I. Joe Volume 2, at a time when Serpentor's The Coil Cult had taken over, an EMP bomb went off, knocking out all electronics in the area with its massive electromagnetic pulse. While Skidmark was working with General Hawk to arrest Overlord, a helicopter above lost power, fell from the sky, landed on Skidmark, and exploded. Those helicopter skids really left a mark. He was then buried at Arlington National Cemetery to stand eternal watch with the rest of his fallen brothers and sisters. In Transformers vs. G.I. Joe in 2015, when the Joes were trapped on Cybertron, we have a bizarre bizarre appearance of Skidmark. He's curled up in a ball with some lettuce and tomatoes as a salad, a meal for Megatron. Yeah, Megatron ate Skidmark alive, replacing Turbo Fox with a Desert Fox driver. This is interesting because there's also a Decepticon Minicon with the name Skidmark too. Many years later in IDW's A Real American Hero issue 269 when Laura 343 had Sean Collins prisoner, the Desert Fox made a small appearance in the Joe's motor pool as they began spinning up a response. And I don't know what's happening here in this G.I. Joe coloring book from 1989, but just know that Skidmark is okay, it was just a scratch. Skidmark's first action figure was released in 1988, and he was boxed with the Desert Fox vehicle and, well, not much else. In Europe, Skidmark was released with the name Treadmark, the same name he'd get years later for his figure subscription service release due to trademark complications. Treadmark, though, actually comes with some accessories unlike his original version. The Fun School Desert Fox was much more brown, like this example here. And the Desert Fox was also re-released by Walmart in 1993 for the Dino Hunters Mission playset. Now it was blue and replaced that rear anti-aircraft cannon with a pair of quick capture grappling hooks and made the missiles into mobile-based sonic missiles. That set came with ambush, low light, and a dinosaur. So to sum up Skidmark, we again turn to his file card which says, the worst thing that his teammates can say about him is the best thing that a soldier can say about another soldier. He does his job. And with that, that's a wrap on this one, my friends. Let's get out of here before Skidmark's reckless driving gets us an article 15. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.